Australia continues to endure a long, hot and tragic summer. Extreme conditions have contributed to extreme disasters. The worst, of course, has been the bushfires burning all over the country, many of which are still active. Despite the heroic efforts of thousands of brave men and women, lives have been lost and enormous amounts of property destroyed. Why is naturally the first question people want answered. Can we stop it happening again is the next. Tonight, we take those questions to a special 60 Minutes War Room. But first, let's look back at the firefight that shook Australia. 2019. It has been Australia's hottest and driest year on record. Records are broken too for the start of the bushfire season, with fires sparking in Queensland as early as June. As the fires head south, the warnings are ominous for a dangerous summer ahead. There was no moisture in the landscape and fires were starting easily and spreading very quickly. Then on Saturday, October the 26th, a single bolt of lightning strikes the remote Gospers Mountain in New South Wales, deep in the dense Wollomai National Park. The Gospers Mountain fire has already burnt out more than 440,000 hectares. Over the next two months, it becomes the biggest bushfire in Australian history. Damaging, destructive, deadly fires across New South Wales. All the arsenal in the world isn't going to put these things out. Blazers are now to the north. Kick the fence down if you have to. And south. Oh dear. This is as bad as it gets. The firestorm is gathering. All the dynamics were at play to be the worst possible. The temperatures, the absolutely. winds. The conditions are absolutely horrific. It breaks in a fury on the final day of the decade. It felt like, as a country, we were preparing for doomsday. What we saw on New Year's Eve was fire behaviour exceeding worst case scenario. Hey, the bushfire ripped over the mountains, straight towards packed holiday spots. A fire front unlike anything we've ever seen. We had 30 metre walls of flame and firefighters had to run for their lives. Yes, I put the blanket up. Uncontrolled mega blazes that in many cases cannot be fought, only fled. Jesus, mate. Mother Nature, the energy created by bushfires uh, under those sorts of conditions will consume whatever is in its path. And behind me is f***ing Malakuta. The names of villages and towns scorched into the history of those terrible 24 hours. More than 4,000 people with nowhere to go. Thousands of bushfire refugees seeking shelter on the beaches. We were talking about life and death. The new year dawns to a blackened land and the reality of a new suffering. It seems scarcely believable that the fires can get any worse. But the devastated country, its people and its firefighters have only three scant days before the weather is predicted to turn catastrophic again. And in the early hours of January 4, it does. Across Australia, heat records are smashed. At 48.9 degrees, Western Sydney is the hottest place on the planet. A deadly new blaze ignites on Kangaroo Island in South Australia. And fueled by 100 kilometre an hour winds in New South Wales and Victoria, it is a day and night of utter terror. The largest fire front in the country's history. We're seeing fire behaviour that's never been seen before. Fires so big they create their own deadly weather fires that turn into tornadoes. They are frightening. They can be strong enough to rip small trees out of the ground. That's the sort of ferocity that you get, and we're not used to this. By night's end, Australia has changed. Uh, yeah, I, I, I can't even speak. 
the nation is shell-shocked. I looked at the wide eyes of some of the firefighters and yet they were terrified. It is fire as we have never known it before. This is our council of war. Craig Lapsley, former Victorian Fire Commissioner. Army veteran, Major General Peter Dunn. US climatologist Michael Mann. And Barnaby Joyce, one of the loudest voices in government. So gentlemen, Australia feels like it's under siege at a calamitous turning point where people seem deeply shocked, grief stricken and some very, very angry. Is that how you feel? Do you feel as overwhelmed as the nation seems to be at the moment? So Tara, it doesn't matter where the fires are, it's impacting on economics, it's impacting on livelihoods, it's impacting on safety, it's causing trauma. It's causing trauma that will be with our communities for decades, if not lifetimes. Do you believe then that this summer has been a wake-up call? This summer is a, an absolute indicator of change of significance, that if you have not been able to imagine what it would be like, right. you have just experienced it. So that has to drive leadership, a leadership at every level. Mm. Do you accept, Barnaby, that during this fire crisis, we've been let down by our Prime Minister? Um, look, I think even the Prime Minister would say that he, you know, it, it wasn't a good day at the wicket for him, and he acknowledged that when he came back from uh, his holidays in Hawaii. Nah, you're an idiot, mate. Oh. You really are. But what's driving him not being able to see what we were facing as a nation? I mean, uh, what? Yeah, I, I mean, I, because he has been heavily criticised for a lack of empathy, lack of action. Uh, yeah, I, look, I, you learn, don't you? I mean, I, I had. What the Prime Minister experienced, I think most politicians experience. It's not how people vote that causes fires. Fires cause fires. But, you know, in hindsight, I would not take the media to where people are grieving. I would go in yourself and accept your medicine. They're going to scream at you and they're going to get angry with you because they have every right to. This is not fair. We are totally forgotten about down here. Do you accept that as a government you've lost a lot of the faith of the community, that the government can protect us yeah, in the future. Yeah, of course. I, I, you know, I, I'm always trying to be straight. Of course we've lost it and we've got to rebuild it. Michael, you're visiting Australia to observe extreme weather conditions. I planned a sabbatical here more than two years ago to study the impacts of climate change on extreme weather events here in Australia and, of course, arrived for uh, arguably what is the most profound bout of extreme weather that Australia has experienced. When you turn the entire continent, or large parts of it, into a tinderbox, there's really no amount of fire suppression or backburning that's going to get you out of the problem. People ask me, is this a, a new normal for Australia? Um, it's worse than that. We've already seen what one degree warming does to Australia. Imagine four. Would you accept that right now the lucky country doesn't feel quite so lucky? We've lost so much, you know, property, lives, obviously, communities, but also a sense of security, a sense of safety. There is a feeling of helplessness. There's also a feeling that we really need to attack what the real enemy is. Uh, the fire, the winds, uh, the, the, uh, and the flooding rates that we've got as well are the weapons. They're the weapons of a mother nature that's turned very, very nasty. It's like a military operation. It feels like a military operation we're losing. Well, yes, you, you can't look at the, the maps of Australia and say that the uh, returning uh, armies have been triumphant. Uh, there have been very successful battles all around the country and the heroism has been nothing short of magnificent. Uh, but at the end of the day, we have to sit back and say we lost this one and we're still losing it. From your experience and then the experience of this summer, do you think these mega fires are fightable? Uh, no, no, no. We're getting to the point now where um, the traditional tactics that are being deployed are not uh, effective. Lake Conjola represents a lot of communities around Australia where the fire came far more quickly than was predicted, the damage has been total. Let's have a look. Today, Lake Conjola and its surrounds remain blackened and scarred, like so many towns in Australia. It's home to Major General Peter Dunn. He's known the worst of fire and war, but this was a terror like no other. So, Peter, you're a man experienced with fires. You've been through this before, but how would you describe what happened here? What happened here? It, it, it was like a nuclear explosion. 
was terrifying. You know, I've spent 38 years in the military, uh, combat operations in Vietnam and things. Uh, uh, it, it, it's just something that is completely different. It's a monster. In this tiny pocket, the damage was overwhelming, with a third of Conjola engulfed and destroyed. Nearly 90 homes were razed and three people killed. Lucky to escape with their lives, but nothing else, were Paul and Marilyn Schunderwood. Their home and meticulous gardens of 15 years, now a ravaged mess. I mean, it's just, mm. it's gone. Yeah, I know. You didn't seem surrounded by trees. We thought we were pretty safe. It was just a firestorm, you know, it was just yeah. unbelievable. What was it like to, to watch it? Oh. Well, we, we've, yeah. <laughs> With the only road out of Conjola closed, they had no choice but to flee through the flames. Um, With Marilyn's 99-year-old father and her sister's young grandchildren, they were forced to drive through a searing and terrifying tunnel of fire to get to water. Must have been like a scene out of hell. Terrifying. Yeah, it, yes, the kids, yes, the kids yes, are yeah. terrifying. The flames were like maybe 20, 30 metres on either side of us. It was creating its own howling wind and the embers hitting against the car. I put my hand on the window at one stage I was driving and I couldn't touch the window came out of that last corner and we saw the smoke clear. It was just an emotional release, yeah. you know, to, to, to know you made it. It must have been terrifying. Mm. It's not something I want to do again. No, 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 no. Yeah, no. So, you know, it's, it's, it's probably one of the worst things that we've experienced. As they did in Victoria's Malakuta, the distressed people of Conjola fled the oncoming fire to the water's edge, the only safe place left to them. Nothing seems to epitomise that desperation more than those images of people rushing to the beach, uh, that's rushing right. to the water. So that was an absolute inferno over there. This was not a pretty place to be. Peter was one of the lucky ones, his home spared in a landscape blasted by a fire that couldn't be stopped. We've really got to start thinking about how we, how we manage these sorts of things. Uh, the, the traditional approach to bushfire fighting uh, has been well and truly proven to be ineffective. Mm. Uh, I mean, if it's not too personal, I mean, you still sound traumatised by yeah, I am. And this community too, I'd imagine. <laughs> Wait for it. You all right? Yeah. <laughs> Stop. It's OK. It's OK. <laughs> oh, look, <clears throat> we all are. Um, and we lost people. And look at it. Mm. I think it's so raw here because this is the community. Mm. It, it's a very close community, and uh, you know, uh, we want to see it come back. And people are here because it's so beautiful. There's so much wildlife, um, so many bushwalks. The playground's gone. Yeah, yeah. The emotions run deep, hey? Oh, very deep, and they, and they still are. They will for many, many years. But we cannot step away from the root cause of this, and it is climate change. Now, it doesn't hurt to say that, but in Australia, we're the harbinger, we're the canary in the mine, and we've seen it up close and personal. The scale of this destruction is truly shocking for what it's done to this land and its people. But what makes it worse, if it really can be made worse, is that we shouldn't be shocked. We've ignored warning after warning that this was to come. Predictions that even gave us a doomsday date of 2020. This is cold. Don't be afraid. Don't be scared. Don't 
But for the last decade, climate change has been the stuff of jokes, and for those who raise it, public mockery. Now it's okay for the member for Melbourne to sip on his latte, to put his sandals up on the seat. Come on, boys. Come on, let's go. We don't need the ratings for some pure, enlightened and woke capital city greenies at this time when they're trying to save their homes. But the warnings have been universal from some of the most respected scientists and economists in the world. Perhaps the most prescient was Ross Garno, the man who in 2007 was tasked with looking at the economic and environmental impacts of doing nothing in the face of a changing climate. Fire seasons will start earlier and generally be more intense. This should be directly observable by 2020. The failure of our generation will haunt humanity until the end of time. Then in 2009, a year after Garneau's report, the CSIRO also sounded the alarm, also directly linking climate change to Australia's bushfire threat, and again predicting that threat could become real in 2020. Climate change will affect fire regimes in Australia. By 2020, extreme fire danger days may occur more often than at present. It's cold. It was dug up by men and women who work and live in the electorates of those who sit opposite. Frustrated by ongoing government inaction, Australia's most senior former fire and emergency services leaders stepped forward in April last year requesting a meeting with the Prime Minister. Climate change, they wanted to warn, had put Australia on the brink of bushfire catastrophe. In our decades of service, we've seen Australia become drier, hotter and extreme weather conditions far more severe. We asked to see the Prime Minister and the reply was, no, I'm too busy. Specifically, what warnings would you say the government has ignored? Look, fundamentally, we're trying to alert the government to what we thought was going to be the most severe bushfire season on record. We thought, this is it, this is the big one. And the bottom line is, our bushfires are driven by weather. They're not driven by fuel, they're not driven by arsonists, they're not driven by greenies stopping us doing burning. They're driven by extreme weather. And on the worst days, you can't pull these fires up. No fire service on earth can. Okay. Too to much, me, I can see it coming. Too much talk, too little action, as, as it has been raised there. Look, everything that they've said there, I basically agree with, right? Of course, the climate's changing. Of course, it's causing... But there's been, like, warning after warning coming what? across the desk. What is that? A the... decade of dithering, a decade of no, disbelief? No, you've got what to... What is it? If to put out the fires, to mitigate the fires, because there is, you're not going to put them out. The climate is changing. You're not going to do it by having this incredible debate in Canberra. So, look, if, if any bureaucrat thinks that climate change is not a reality and should be discussed. And if you're not a climate change believer, go to the science. The science clearly tells you that climate has changed. Why do you think Scott Morrison didn't want to hear from the experts? Do you think part of his misstep is, is his belief system, that, you know, he just doesn't believe in climate change? Well, I don't think that's the case. I, I think that, you know, I, I think that's... He believes that Australia's got to do its part, and it is doing its part. In all fairness, Barnaby, Scott Morrison and his government have played a destructive role in global negotiations to act on climate. Uh, they have uh, literally dismissed the connection between climate change and these unprecedented bushfires that we're experiencing. And the scientific community has spoken authoritatively on this matter. Barnaby, do you accept that these fires have been driven by climate change? Uh, I absolutely accept that, you know, we've, got, we've had a massive change in the climate. I can see it in my own area. That is not my argument. My argument is one of uh, immediate efficacy. We're going to put back in our fire breaks. We're going to make sure we build our central watering points, that no truck has to travel more than 20 kilometres. You know, these are the things that I want to concentrate on. You can't solve a problem no, right. if you refuse to accept the well, cause of the problem. we have complied with our international agreements. Now, the second thing I want no, to take... No, that's not true. I'm going to... Well, we have. No, and, through yeah, an accounting trick, but anyways. Well, coal is Australia's biggest export between coal and iron ore. 
And therefore, the money that comes from that, whether you like it or not, supports our hospitals, our schools, our defence force. You've got to say to the Australian people, we're going to get rid of that income stream and you've got to accept that this money is not going to turn up. That is the price. Are you willing to pay it? And I'll tell you what happens in politics if you do that, you lose the election. But Barnaby, are we overstating, are we actually overstating the wealth of coal to this country? I mean, it's 2.2% no, of the GDP. It's it employs 0.4% of the population. How about the hundreds of millions of dollars being lost in tourism, the damage that's being done by these unprecedented bushfires, the cost of climate inaction far outweighs the modest cost of taking action. Well, I think we're going to this sort of global point and it's really true here in to, Australia. Uh, okay. This are is you the saying, front lines you, of climate are you change saying impacts. That if Australia changes its domestic policies, the climate will change. This idea that Australia yeah, really. unilaterally will make a decision that's going to change the climate is absurd. What I'm saying is if you want to talk about the, the small number of state actors that are basically sabotaging climate action for the entire planet, you can count them on the fingers of your hand. It's Saudi Arabia, it's Russia, it's the United States, yeah. Brazil, and does Australia want to be part of that family? If you want to sell this program, you got to say to them, how are you going to make their lives more affordable and put dignity back into their lives? Because that is the reality of the person. What dignity have you life. got, Barnaby, when you are standing in the middle of rubble and saying, how on earth did this fire happen? What's driving this? What's the head of the serpent? And it's climate change. Yeah, I'm just... But the people of this country want the politicians to step up. Mm. I mean, okay. I, I, it is the existential issue that the public have raised. And it defeats me as to why you won't step up to it. So we've lost a decade. We need to get to work. Ross Garno said so. He's right. All the predictions, damn it, have turned out to be right. Well, I mentioned... Actually, no, they've been wrong. Uh, in many respects, things are worse than we predicted just a decade ago. Yeah. Here in Australia, we are seeing an unimaginable no. crisis take you know, place. We... We're not seeing the sort of action that we need to see here in Australia and around the rest of the world to avert truly catastrophic well, we, climate we, we... change. It's your responsibility, isn't it? I mean, as the government, it's, it's what, it, you know, the public are putting yeah, the future into your hands. Tara, I must resist to the core of my being to throwing up my hands and saying, it's all too hard, I'm, I'm jumping off. You know, you've got to say, here's the problem, let's sit down and think about how we do this noting all the consequences and taking the constituency with us on the good news and the bad news. It's just that we've had such a long time to do it, haven't we? And, and well, we're, we're, not, I mean, we're it, not getting there. We've got to manage for the reality of where we are. But according to firefighting experts, even the supply of critical resources has been ignored. Fire call message red, click your gap and message red. Like, crash time. And if Australians needed any further proof we're fighting a war, it came on the tragic afternoon of January 23rd. And initial reports are uh, that there was a large fireball associated with the impact of the plane. It had already been another hell day for firefighters in New South Wales' snowy mountains. Now three more of their own were dead. The giant C-130 and the other massive fixed-wing water bombers are the heaviest guns of all in a new era of bushfire fighting. This is about national defence. This is about keeping communities safe and secure and saving lives. As awesome as these aircraft are, we don't have enough, and our nation's leaders have known that for years. Nor, apart from one, are they ours. They're all leased from North America, and because our fire seasons are longer, they now overlap the Northern Hemisphere. So when we need air aircraft in August and September and October, they're still using them in California, so they, they're not available. So in March 2018, the National Aerial Firefighting Centre put a business plan to the federal government for a dedicated national water bomber fleet. That plan was ignored. I am quite upset about the fact they sat on a business case for aircraft for two years and didn't act on it. So we were left without critical aircraft and it was so unnecessary. But then an astonishing turnaround. On January 4th this year, with the country up in flames and feeling the political heat himself, Scott Morrison suddenly approved the two-year-old water bomber plan, telling the media 
before he told firefighting agencies. Are you going to commit to that? Or... Well, I just did. Finally, in that infamous press conference, um, but they've committed to that business case. So let's rule the line, move on. So forgive, but you can't forget. Don't forget. Don't forget, because uh, this is about not listening. And the, that, that's the issue. Is that a fair cop, Barnaby, not think, listening? Well, we've got to have the, the, the ability, and if we're not, if the government doesn't own it, we've got to have operators in Australia who we have the you know, first right of, of call on. But we've got to sort it out, right? Yeah, I, I mean... I, I, we have to do everything. And if that is required, uh, a greater platform that we can utilise, sure. What do you gentlemen think it speaks to? Is it just trying to save pennies or not taking the threat seriously? I, I don't know the reason why you wouldn't listen to a report that was presented through a, a group of experts that understand um, fire aviation and that was two years of an unanswered report. I don't understand why that's the case. Um, to me, it was a very simple, it's not a big ask. If, if we had a, a bigger fleet of those bigger planes, would there be more houses saved today? Would there be lives saved today? Uh, I believe, yes, there would be, absolutely. For the type of fire intensive we've had, um, the large air fleet is extremely, extremely important. The larger the, the drop of retardant or water, um, to either in front of fire or direct attack, uh, is absolutely critical. I just, you know, I believe that this is essential. It's something that we all agree on. It's uh, having a greater platform. Mm -hmm. And so on, the, on this issue, I've got no arguments whatsoever. Do you think on this issue at least uh, the government's now listening? Well, you have to if you want to survive. The sacrifices made over this endless summer of burning have been overwhelming. Go on, go on further up there. We'll get out. And none are more humbling than those of the volunteer fireys who day and night have been on the front line of this firefight. <laughs> Ready, set, go. Well, baby Charlotte, you need to know that your dad was a selfless man. He was a special man. Wow, look at these ones. And he only left us because he was a hero. Andrew O'Dwyer was a hero, losing his life trying to save others. The volunteer firefighter and fellow fiery and good mate Jeff Keaton were killed just a week before Christmas. Andrew was an adoring father to 21-month-old Charlotte and a loving husband to Mel. I'm devastated for Charlotte that she doesn't get to see her dad and he doesn't get to see her grow up. Um, like, my husband's gone. Like, I miss him a lot. That's hard. But, yeah. Sorry. Andrew and Jeff. Two volunteer firefighters, two fathers, and two funerals. For Andrew's father, Errol, the pain is crushing. When I went up to fire station, I just um, was asking questions. I couldn't see where my son was. And I said, what, ha what happened to my son? It's just uh, the heartache now is too much. Is is left a big gap in my heart, and I can't. The fire was raging out of control near Buxton, on the fringes of Sydney's southwest. Andrew wasn't even on the roster, but called in to join the strike team. And did he talk to you before he went into the fire? Yes, he did. He told me he loved me, and I told him I loved him back. Did you have any fear for him at that I point? I didn't, actually. I don't think I actually knew how bad those fires were. I did read a message on his phone afterwards that he'd actually said that they were going into hell. Andrew and Jeff were in the front of the fire truck, three others in the back. Second, in a four-truck convoy, they were racing along this road into the fire when a burning tree fell across the cabin, killing the two men instantly. 
Watch the sky changing colour. Today, a memorial has been built at the site where, after careening out of control for nearly 200 metres, the truck finally came to a stop. It still doesn't feel real to me. It still feels very surreal. Feel myself sinking under. It's not until I actually really sit down and think, and I think, no, he's not here, he's not coming back, and that's hard. Andrew's young wife, Mel, now faces a very different life to the one she imagined when she married the gregarious outdoorsman nearly seven years ago. This is... Where's she gone? A very different life too yeah. for their beloved daughter, Charlotte, the yeah. apple of her father's eye. Hi. How would you like him to be remembered? For the hero that he was, like always going out above and beyond to help others, his family, his friends, just, yeah, put his life on the line to help other people in need and ended up losing his life. That's a hero to me. No doubt there have been many acts of heroism, but in the future, is it fair to ask these volunteers, to ask men and women to go and fight these fires? You liken these fires to a war. Mm. So how do we arm our firefighters better? How do we, and can we, Fireproof Australia. Once you put fire into the landscape now, you've got a problem. So we have to have the ability to react very, very quickly. We need fast response systems. We need different protection systems. In particular, we need different detection systems. What are those detection systems? Planes or...? Uh, aircraft, infrared scanning. Uh, you do it in the military. If there are enemy there, you go and take those enemy out. And that's exactly what's got to happen now. But it's also got to be about the upper atmosphere, the environment we're operating in, which is about these uh, pyrocumulus clouds and mini tornadoes. We can use space-based technology to actually advise to the ground. But what we've got to do is get it to the ground. So the, the weather around these fires is so fundamental to understand, but yet fire trucks haven't got that technology on them. Mm. Now, that's got to be there. We're, we're in a world of innovation yeah. and technology. We've got to bring it to the people that are making decisions so they make better decisions at every level. This summer, there's been a lot of controversy over the use of the military. Mm. You want the military involved in future? Oh, absolutely, and it always has been and it always will be. I bet Peter you'd say, look, that the, what you learn from training and fighting a fire can then be applied to fighting a war. Chain of command, um, uh, understanding what your landscape's like, learning tactics, it's, they're, they're similar uh, skill sets. Absolutely. This was a war. Uh, we were invaded by a massive uh, enemy all over the country. And those military techniques in operations need to be applied to this. So in terms of planning, do you believe that all the communities that have been affected, decimated by these fires, will be able to rebuild? And should they be allowed to rebuild in these areas? Um, the answer to that is, yes, you should have the right. However, what you build to could be questionable because now we've got different bushfire attack level standards. That means it could be cost prohibitive. That is, I've, my house has been burnt down. What I need to rebuild to a new standard will be an increased cost for the safety of that building. You have to tell people the risk and say, do you understand the risk that you are now uh, taking by doing this? Do you understand what the consequences are? Do you understand if there's a fire? We can't promise you that we can either save you or the house. Now, it's over to you. If you start saying, I'm going to regulate you out of everywhere, yeah. people are just yeah. going to say, mate, yeah. get, out yeah. get out of my life. Get out of my life. And you can hear the way the conversation's going. Or, you know, it's going to be everyone living in a bunker. Mm. Yeah. That ain't going to happen. Mm. Michael, can you describe what you see the fires of the future looking like? They become more intense, they become faster spreading, uh, they become more extensive. Australia, if you were going to design a continent that was going to be most impacted by climate change, Australia is the continent you would design, centred right in the subtropics, already extremes of heat and drought that make much of the continent unlivable. But Australia is also the country you would design if you were looking to generate renewable energy. You've got immense amounts of sun, you've got wind, and so if there's any country where it makes sense to get off fossil fuels and move to renewable energy, it is Australia. We're not a big country, but we've got a very good name across the globe. And it's been across the globe that they've watched us, and they do care about our wildlife and our people. Yeah. 
So let's, let's come off that. Let's make a, something that's been bad to be something good. But if we keep up this debate and no action, that's, that's just counterproductive. Mm. And it's actually, it's making a lot of people hostile. Let's be a nation of leaders. Let's be the leaders of the globe. Hello, I'm Tara Brown. Thanks for watching. To keep up with the latest from 60 Minutes Australia, make sure you subscribe to our channel. You can also download the Nine Now app for full episodes and other exclusive 60 Minutes content.